Hello team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan MSP. So Ukraine War News Update, first part there for the 20th of November 2024. Uh, sorry I'm a little bit later today in releasing this. It's the uh, result of having a night uh, on the tiles with my mates, uh, talking politics, philosophy, so sorting out the world. T turns out that we, um, that we did solve all the world's problems. But by the time I got home, I'd forgotten about, I'd forgotten all the solutions. Anyway, we, we definitely solved them. Uh, let's go to the Ukraine in general stuff. Figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply. And you can find them in the description to the video below. 1,690 personnel lost is a massive number. Almost at that 1,700 um, uh, point in the spectrum of losses there. Just a huge number of losses yet again. Uh, for the Russians, eight tanks, which is pretty much on the daily average, 27 armored personnel vehicles above the daily average, 49 artillery systems, that's a pretty significant number there. And then two anti-aircraft warfare systems, haven't seen many in that category for some time. Uh, 100 vehicles and fuel tanks is very high there, and two pieces of special equipment. So problematic numbers for the Russians yet again, uh, indicating that it is a particularly hot front line at the moment. Uh, of course, the Russians making some good gains right across the front lines. So that means, well, it's uh, bad news for the Ukrainians in respect to territorial gains, but good news in terms of Russian losses. That's a calculus they seem to be happy enough to make the Russians. Here are the losses for the 18th. We also have the 19th as well. So two sets of losses here. Personnel loss, 84 for the first day. 197 uh, visually confirmed human beings to have been killed on that day of looking at videos. Uh, that's a pretty macabre pastime there for Andrew, but um, interesting to see those trends, right? When we look at the Russian losses against Ukrainian losses, we can see two days ago they were huge and actually combat losses, that's about a six to one. A uh, really good day for the Ukrainians in terms of those losses. We'll look at the Ukrainians losses, Ukraine losses first. We have a few bits of artillery, including a high Mars damaged by Lancet. I've not seen that video. Interesting. Uh, it, good to see that some new high, high Mars launchers are on the next package, I think, of military equipment being given to Ukraine. A $275 million package from the US. They are including some high Mars. So... I personally think that it must have been just getting through high miles and the amount that they're getting used, driven around, fired every single night. I imagine they are the most used. Well, actually, all of the Ukraine's equipment is going to be heavily used every single day. Uh, we have some uh, a few tanks there damaged, mainly a couple of infantry fighting vehicles, BMP-1 and 2, destroyed and abandoned. Some APCs, usual uh, suspects there, and a couple of MRAPs. Nothing too problematic actually in this day's loss list a couple of buggies and some some civilian vehicles as well and when we go to the russian list it is much much longer and this shows the kind of ratio uh, that the ukrainians need an electronic warfare on top of a loaf ew kit on top of a loaf there by the looks of it taken out a recovery vehicle vehicle some ground drones Artillery, mainly D-30s, about uh, 10 tanks there, a range of tanks, <laughs> track garden sheds, and then he's got T-62 MV garbage pile. That's obviously a, a tank with all sorts of crud put on top, I'm imagining. T-90M damage, damaged as well, that's uh, Russia's best tank there, so good to see that. And then infantry fighting vehicles, goodness me, probably 25 there. Maybe even more, maybe 30. I don't know. It's just a massive array of IFVs, mainly BTRs and uh, a few BMP2s and 3s. But a lot of BTRs thrown in on that list. And that's just an incredibly long list of equipment. APCs, about 15 of those, mainly ZSTS Achmats. Uh, I presume they're being lost in the Kursk region. And then trucks and ATVs, a lot of Desert Cross 1000-3 buggies, uh, and a, a number of civilian vehicles too, motorcycles, loafs, flatbeds, etc., etc. So a lot of kit there 
um, on the loss list for the Russians, really losing an awful lot. That's two days ago. And when we go to yesterday's numbers, we have 197 people uh, registered as lost on the on his database, which is pretty huge. In terms of the equipment, we've got Ukrainians losing fewer pieces than the Russians, uh, but not by a lot. But actually, when it comes to um, when it comes to combat asset losses, Russians losing about two to one uh, ratio. There, we go to the Ukrainian losses first and look at what they uh, had lost over the last twenty four hours. We've got a multiple launch rocket system, BM twenty one Grad damaged. We've got a couple of tanks, T eighties damaged. Um, some infantry fighting vehicles, about ten of them, um, just over half of them abandoned. And destroyed but mainly actually BMPs there is a marder that's abandoned there and then hit by vandal drone and then another marder hit by a vandal drone as well and damaged vandal drones seem to be uh, popping up an awful lot more on these lost lists uh, APCs five of those mainly damaged so that's good news there and MRAPs um, five of those three of them abandoned two damaged nothing too bad from this list from the Ukrainians point of view quite a lot of civilian vehicles and then at the bottom here, we have civilian vehicles driven by civilians, including a bus. That bus was attacked in Kherson, uh, dropping a drone on clearly a civilian bus. A yellow, big yellow bus is absolutely unconscionable. And that is what the Russians do. It's just, I can't believe that people around the world still have sympathies for the Russians here and uh, seem to be blaming the Ukrainians. It's just absolutely dis despicable, in my opinion. Um, for the Russian losses, we have... Um, an air defense system, a book M1 or two destroyed, engineering vehicle taken out, a drone and uh, a UGV mine laying drone taken out, and a boat sunk, um, and then some artillery pieces, quite a few tanks actually, a dozen tanks, including some uh, track garden sheds, coupled with mine rollers, and we have a T90. M damaged again two days in a row there but otherwise mainly t-72s and t-80s and then infantry fighting vehicles about 20 of them just huge numbers um just over half of them abandoned and destroy or destroyed uh, mainly bmp ones twos and threes with some btr 82s thrown in as well and then apcs we get down to about half a dozen of them btrs uh mainly destroyed and abandoned a couple damaged and then the usual four wheelers the quads uh, and civilian vehicles and trucks thrown in as well so an awful lot of equipment that the russians have lost over the last couple of days and that is surely surely is going to be hurting the russians now let's try and piece some some of the jigsaw pieces together to see what picture of the war we can uh, C. An entire regiment, says PS01, of the 20th Motorized Rifle Division of the Russian Armed Forces has deserted. Internal documents from the MOD about an entire regiment of deserters has been posted online. It has become known that more than a thousand soldiers of the Russian 20th Guards Motorized Rifle Division have fled from the front and are listed as having left the unit without permission. The document contains the names, dates of birth, ranks and other information of 858 contract soldiers. 150 mobilized soldiers and two conscripts. Among them are 26 junior officers, a major and two lieutenant colonels. Russian journalists managed to confirm the authenticity of this list. It also became known that a large number of the servicemen who left the unit without permission are listed in the 98th Guards Airborne Division. That's absolutely incredible if indeed true that the Russians have lost over a thousand soldiers and that includes some officers of fairly high rank as well thrown in too quite incredible uh, to have lost that many to desertion although i guess unsurprising now andrew perpetua saying the russian strategy right now in kursk is to basically charge until everyone dies then get more people and charge until they all die repeat forever the 810th brigade is getting absolutely massacred it's carnage the number of missing they have is a thousand or more likely all dead and that's only the missing reported by family members on social media and it is only one brigade it is to the point where the 810th is having to take soldiers from other brigades to fill its ranks to continue its endless suicide march they are consuming every soldier they can find it's pure 
madness. That's a really interesting observation from Andrew. Andrew Andrew is often seen as a bit of a doomer. So when he does say these things that seem to be very positive for Ukraine or very problematic for Russia, I think it's it's interesting to see it in that context and to, to think, well, he, he is seeing this stuff. He is seeing the evidence of this. This is not looking good for the Russians in Kursk. Even though the Ukrainians are ceding territory to the Russians, the Russians are inevitably making their gains. But man, the, the losses that they are incurring and we can see that from you know adding all these jigsaw pieces together looking at what the ukrainian general staff have to say and thinking yeah okay a thousand people are desert from there yeah it, it is not going i say it's not going well for the russians if you are certain people looking on into ukraine you think it's going very well for the russians but actually it's coming at a huge cost and even uh, the Russian doctor Mengel uh, says about Kursk here, Russian military doctor Yuri Yevich, a butcher famous for torturing prisoners of war, whines that Ukraine has a complete superiority in drones in Kursk. They easily spend up to five drones per infantryman and 15 to 20 drones per, p- uh, per piece of equipment. So it's an incredibly interesting observation there and goes to show how important drones are and the asymmetry Ukraine has and needs to continue having. There was a claim from Kriegsforscher. Um, so talking about, uh, in fact, I'll go through that now um, because I think it's pretty useful. Um, where he's saying that actually we need to keep having, um, is it here? Yes, if you ask me about the most problematic directions that the Ukrainian the Ukrainians face right now, I will tell you next. So this is a guy that's up in the Kursk area. One, we don't have anti-personal mines to protect our positions. Two, our infantry cannot sustain a contact with enemy during a fight in trenches. Problem number one will help with problem number two. Uh, and this is in response to, he's saying that in response to Biden last night has authorised the provision of anti-personnel landmines to Ukraine. So this is a, an a, about face on a decision that's been long held with the Americans. Now they are providing anti-personnel mines to Ukraine. So two US officials said a step that will bolster Kyiv's defences against advancing Russian troops, but has drawn criticism from armed control groups. OK, we've been through the whole mines issue previously. Uh, I think this is from a military point of view. Right now, exactly what Ukraine needs. Now, this I'm bringing that into into play here because the idea is that the the Ukrainians have this really good drone superiority that means that they are very good at repelling Russian attacks when they are in transit and hitting those vehicles, and then people have to alight from those vehicles, and then they get hit by um, by drones. In fact, we've got a video of exactly this happening. Um, a Russian assault group on unarmoured civilian Lada Neva vehicles tried to attack the positions of the 60th Brigade in Ukraine. And this is a, a video of an attack whereby they get halted by drones dropping munitions on them, um, probably FPV drones as well. And they're not interesting that they're in unarmored vehicles. So this goes back to they're running out of the correct vehicles in so many places on, even though we are seeing huge numbers of IFVs and APCs, or actually not so many APCs these days, a lot of IFVs, we are not seeing as many MTLBs as we used to see. I think uh, there are claims that they've run out of them in the, in the deep stockpiles, and so we're probably seeing fewer and fewer of them. They're the old tracked vehicle, the old tractors that the Russian army uses a lot of. I was going to say there's not so many APCs, actually quite a lot there, but now we're starting to see slightly different ones here. But a lot of infantry fighting vehicles still However, they are attacking in so many places on the front line that these are probably just a couple of areas where they're using IFVs and APCs. Otherwise, it's down to a lot of civilian and vehicles and ATVs. And we are seeing that evidence with the videos that are coming out. So in this video, the attack gets stopped in transit. The Russians get out the vehicles and then they run off and then they get picked off by drones dropping IEDs on them and it is an absolute disaster this particular one and this then goes this supports what is being said which is that they've got this drone advantage but how is it they're still making those gains well if they do manage to break through by overwhelming just going and going and going again until they do get to the Ukrainian positions the trenches they then get the advantage at the trenches of overwhelming the Ukrainians and the Ukrainians not having anti-personnel mines so this is exactly what what your man here Kriegsforscher is saying is that actually you know we um oops 
we we would benefit from having these anti-personnel mines because once we're in contact with the Russians, we can't sustain that and we have to pull back. And that's what you're seeing. So anyway, drones are just insanely important for the Ukrainians. Of course they are. And the mass of which they're being produced gives the Ukrainians their own sense of drone mass where they can afford to use five drones per person, you know, 10 drones per vehicle, 15, 20 drones per vehicle. Anti-personnel and anti-tank mines are one way by which Ukraine is compensating for a lack of infantry. So this isn't anti-personnel mines uh, that are being provided by the US. Th these are just general anti-personnel mines they're getting hold of and anti-tank mines that they are dropping from drones. So offensive and defensive mining is highly effective, enabling Ukraine to hold terrain. Many are dropped by drones now as a form of remote mining, some types uh, with self-liquidating timers. They are trying to be as creative as possible. You, we have seen the ram shells where they're fired from artillery and they spread sort of 19 mines behind Russian lines where they've already cleared and then you go and do it again and they think it's clear and then they drive over and bang. We saw that in Vuhledar particularly, but actually since then, I, it, it seems that they are mining an awful lot more, you know, less so with sappers going out and laying mines, but they've got UGVs, the ground drones, and they've got UAVs, the aerial drones that are dropping them. Uh, and they're being really effective in doing so. Um, back to Kriegsforscher, he said, my folks today destroyed a BM BMD-4M, BMD-2 uh, from the 51st VDV Regiment and a BTR and NTLB from the 155th Marine Brigade. Proud of them, two were destroyed by FBV drones and two were very big bombers. So again, drones. Um, unfortunately, this bloody and useless battle is far from the end. Now, he's up in Kursk, as mentioned, and he said, if war spotting will wait until their November losses update, you will be very, very surprised. This then goes back to what Andrew Perpetua was saying in terms of it's just Russian suicide with the 810th up there in Kursk. And this goes back to the loss list we're seeing and the um, Ukrainian general staff figures. So, Yes, the Russians are making these gains on the front line and things are desperate for Ukraine and, and they're really, really feeding it at the moment. But all the evidence does suggest that the Russians are taking incredible losses. All the, all the parts of the jigsaw are painting that picture. Um, now, Andrew then says, Russian drone pilots, on the other hand, have been attacking Ukrainian tractor vehicles by intentionally hitting the track with an FPV drone. It works. I've seen several vehicles disabled in this manner, and I've long wondered why Ukraine hasn't been doing this. Um, interesting. And I've actually wondered that previously, much earlier in the war, uh, whether, because I, I don't know if you remember, there was an analysis done by Turchny of where the drones were hitting, mainly on vehicles. And I was always wondering, are they explosive enough to disable the track? Because as soon as you disable the track, you're not fixing that in situ. Surely if that, I mean stopping the vehicle is is your best bet yeah okay you want a catastrophic um, explosion is also good but if you've got more chance of just stopping the vehicle and then you can attack it at your own leisure because it's it's been rendered um unmovable but uh i i, I don't know what the success rate in blowing tracks is with fpv drones etc uh, Russia has managed to recruit enough personnel to create new military units despite significant battlefield losses in Ukraine. Data from independent analysts have indicated that at least 150,000 Russians have died in the war. So that's New York Times article there. Interesting, 150,000 dead. Uh, does that fit in line with the the Ukrainian general staff figures? Well, at a 3 to 1 loss ratio, um, 450,000 plus 150,000 600 thousand that's a three to one loss ratio um uh, and that gets you to six hundred thousand a uh, four to one that's wounded to, to killed gets you seven hundred fifty thousand so about three point five to one something like that that's a pretty normal kia to wia number so actually that seems fairly uh, reasonable um but anyway uh new york times so let's just go through this it's only short um situation in ukrainian front lines remains intense uh, as of November, um, Ukrainian forces are facing increased Russian attacks, especially in Sumy Oblast, while also repelling numerous assaults in Kharkiv uh, Oblast. Russian losses are exceeding 1,300 soldiers in a single day and overall casualties surpassing 700,000 since the all-out war began, according to the general, Ukraine's general staff. 
The report notes that accurately estimating Russian casualties is extremely challenging. Russia conceals its losses while Ukraine has reasons to inflate its figures. Russian opposition journalists have compiled data based on publicly available obituaries. Through this method, they have confirmed the deaths of over 78,000 Russian soldiers. Remember, that's, uh, I think, Mediazona and BBC Russia have been doing that. This figure represents a minimum. So this is the absolute uh, minimum. This is, what is it in history? Terminate ad diem, or uh, you get this. This is the absolute minimum date that this thing could have happened. The absolute maximum date. So therefore, it's somewhere in between. Well, in same here. Like there is one hundred percent at least seventy eight thousand Russian soldiers dead. Likely much much more because that doesn't include LPR, doesn't include DPR. So the Luhansk and Donetsk People's Republic armies from within uh, Ukraine's of. Op- op- occupied territories and then also it's just incredibly conservative anyway includes only those whose names are recorded in the database however the database is incomplete since not all deaths are reported in public obituaries so you've got an awful lot of russian uh, commanders not reporting deaths because missing in action is much more preferable because they don't have to pay compensation etc etc another method based on tracking inheritance cases opened by relatives of killed soldiers compared to pre-war times provides a more realistic estimate of approximately 150,000 deaths still this estimate carries significant margins of error with potential underestimation or overestimation of russian casualties losses are just one factor affecting combat effectiveness another critical aspect of success on the front line is the ability to quickly replenish forces with new recruits according to western analysts who have calculated based on Russia's budget expenditures, about 900 new recruits join Russian forces daily. Um, This rate of recruitment has allowed the Russian military not only to replenish losses, but also create new units, said the report. Earlier, the Biden administration stated that Ukraine's current challenges on the front lines stem from a shortage of soldiers rather than a lack of weapons. Uh, US National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said Ukraine should enhance its mobilization efforts to achieve success on the battlefield. This is an ongoing issue, of course. Right, last element for this segment, Russia on fire again, another blaze, uh, this time on the Institute of Civil Aviation. Uh, flames lap up the side of the building there, or the, it's on the roof of the building, it's been evacuated. Uh, n- pr- unlikely to do with the war, but yet yeah, another example of um, a sometimes important infrastructure being uh, damaged by these fires. Okay, moving on to distant strikes, and last night another huge wave of drones attacking Ukraine. 56 of 122 drones sent into Ukraine were taken out by conventional means. Another 58 were lost by electronic warfare. And then another six, I believe, was sent. It says five here, but I, I believe uh, elsewhere it's six was sent back. So if that is the case, that is, I think, 118. Does that make for? Um, so 50, 114 plus 620. Actually, possibly only two drones getting through of 122 is incredibly good. Um, two KH-5969 cruise missiles were shot down by air defence forces, but there were also, that's out of five of them, so three got through, and there was also an S-300 surface-to-air missile rocket sent in, uh, or missiles sent in to Ukraine as well, so still damage done, of course. Now, Russian media last night were reporting a number of drones in three different regions particularly, Belgorod and Voronezh here. Uh, 45 drones initially were claimed to be attacking uh, into Russia, um, al- although earlier Russian military, Ministry of Defence claims that Russian air defence has destroyed 42 drones uh, in the in, within three hours, 32 in Bryansk, five in Smolensk, two in Moscow, and one each in Kursk, Oryol, and Rostov regions. Actually, so there's more more regions than that. Some channels reporting an attempt and a breakthrough to to uh, breakthrough to Moscow. Um, yeah, I, I don't know of the success or not of these drones. The Russians say one thing, and reality could well be something different. We do know that a few places were hit, so let's go through them. First breaking news, says Tim White, uh, this was last night, I believe, and the third attack of the night inside Russia. At the end of yesterday's thread, you may have read of the drone attacks on Voronezh and Belgorod. Well, now it's become clear that Novgorod has also been attacked by Ukraine's drones. It looks like Ukraine has hit another ammo warehouse similar to the one supposedly hit by ATACMS 24 hours previously in Bryansk. 
This attack on the Russian arsenal store is in Kotovo, over 800 kilometers from the Ukrainian border. Locals report that the area nearby being evacuated it was being evacuated with the residents moved to Kulatino, 8 to 10 kilometers away. So that is... Uh, so here we see Ukraine, and that's up past Moscow to Kotovo. So that's a long way northwest of Moscow. It's a very interesting place for the Ukrainians to be striking. Um, anyway, Tim White saying, yeah, Voronezh region and Kometsky district, there is, drones are hitting a Russian factory. It's supposed to be a food production factory, but he says, does it only produce uh, foods? Anyway, the Ukrainians striking that... Um, uh, there's also here in Volgograd a tractor plant, so that's probably some kind of um, military vehicle production facility as being here in Volgograd. They're putting out a fire at an abandoned workshop. I doubt it is abandoned if it's being hit by the Ukrainians. Um, uh, of the tractor plant, fire trucks are being pulled to the scene of the emergency, and that's a Moscow region. Um, and then, yeah, this Russian ammo storage was hit in a drone strike 680 kilometers from the border with Ukraine. Ukrainian forces targeted one of Russia's largest ammo storage facilities, hitting the 13th GRAU arsenal that houses multiple launch rocket launcher systems and strategic missiles. Um, also hit this, this is a food produ produ production facility. Uh, they also hit a plant in Belgorod Oblast overnight. The facility publicly produces food products, but it also makes, and here's the important part, it also makes cargo drones used by the Russian army for military purposes. Last year, Russia invested $398 million in the production of drones. So that's Euromind and Press saying that, yep, not so much a food um, production facility, but a drone production one. But yeah, talking about the, um, the 13th GRAU, Arsenal, the Russian main missile and artillery director, that there is videos of that being struck in uh, Kotovo in Novgorod region. Facility stores ammunition for tube artillery, mortar shells, rockets for Grad Smirch and Uragan multiple launch rocket systems, Iskander missiles, North Korean KN-23 missiles, S-300 and S-400 anti-aircraft missiles, and munitions for the TOR missile. That's an air defense system. That's according to Dimitri from War Translated. So if they have done a lot of damage there, that could be incredibly uh, useful for the Ukrainians. And that's what it would look like normally. Um, and as mentioned, yeah, contains all of those munitions previously uh, listed. Uh, Zelensky commented on the strike on Russian ammunition depot in Bryant. So that's not the one last night, but the one the night before hit with the attackums. He said uh, last night, sorry, no extra details. Ukraine has long range capabilities. We have long range drones of our own production. We now have a long range Neptune missile and not just one. And now we have attackums and we will use all of this, President said. So quite bullish there. Um, now, there was also smoke. This is actually a couple of days back, so two days ago. Rising smoke over Gubkin this morning. Yesterday, explosions were heard in Staryoskog. Details unknown. Well, actually, the GUR is now saying that um, in the city of Gubkin, Russia, the command post of the Northern Troops Group was hit. In the city of Gubkin, Belgorod region, the command post of the North Troop Group, the Russian Occupation Army was successfully hit. So that, that is something else to add. Um, and then there's footage coming out. I mean, you can see lots of footage of all sorts of things uh, here. I just thought it'd be interesting to see GBU-39 guided bombs being used by the Ukrainians, hitting Russian bunkers and ammunition and soldiers in the Zaporizhia direction. So you've got, uh, I don't know if you call it close air support, but you've got strikes on uh, Russian targets here using aviation, using guided glider bombs. That's really good. The, the Ukrainians need to be doing that an awful lot. That's how Russian Russia have had their success over the last year. And the Ukrainians need to be doing that back to the Russians and some. The Russians have been utilising vast numbers of these guided glide bombs. I don't know how many the Ukrainians have at their disposal. You've got the GBU-39. You've got AASM-30. Uh, 500 the French hammer um, uh, guided glide bombs that they are they were getting 50 of those a month to the tune of 600 and then they're just getting a whole whack of 600 I think again so they're, they're potentially getting quite a few of them and hopefully they can just use them 
much more frequently and I do believe they're making their own as well or, or looking to be making their own at some point. Anyway, moving on, US official uh, said that Ukraine fired eight ATACMs the other night uh, at that facility at Bryansk, the ammo depot, on Tuesday, and two were intercepted, so six out of the eight got through. US is still assessing the damage, but the missile strike and ammunition supply location in Karachev in Bryansk region. Uh, Tim White says, while two out of eight is about the best ratio Russia could hope for, I'm really shocked if Ukraine did fire eight valuable missiles at an ammo dump. Uh, I, I guess they they know what's really useful for them to hear, and it could well be that their strikes on ammo facility uh, ammo depots recently, like in the last couple of months, where they there have been some really big ones that we reported about some time back, m might have had incredibly useful effect on the front lines in ways that we we aren't necessarily aware of sitting in our ivory towers back wherever we are, but it could be that, that actually. You know that's a really good target for the Ukrainians to take out, and so committing eight missiles in the hope that most of them get through, or some of them get through, uh, is is a good return on investment, as according to the the um, to the Ukrainians. However, Forbes is reporting that Ukraine's air attackers operation might not last as long as they only have 50 missiles and we'll see whether they get a whole load of more attackers with subsequent uh, military assistance from the US they've got 2 months the US to uh, basically exactly 2 months now to get as much stuff as they can to Ukraine before the Trump administration comes in but uh, Tataragami said that Ukraine's potential to inflict damage has increased but it does face significant limitations. Um, and then, again, exactly what I've been saying for a long time, which is it was a US what did it. Starmer, Keir Starmer, the UK's Prime Minister, said about ATACMs to Ukraine that it was, in fact, straightforward. He wants to allow Ukraine to use the weapons as it sees fit for its self-defence. Behind the scenes, according to the Times, Britain has been pressing the US on the issue for months. Starmer drops hint on the UK tactics after Ukraine fires US missiles. The PM has seemed to suggest it was just a matter of time before British-made Storm Shadow missiles are used by Zelensky against Russia. Uh, yeah, and it, again, it just seems like that, that's been held up by the Americans. Right, okay. So the United States Embassy in Kiev, moving on to other bits and pieces, has issued an urgent warning on Wednesday, so that's today, that Russia is planning a significant air attack. So they've closed the embassy and told their employees to shelter in place. So I presume that's imminent, right? It's not only that, but Spain has closed their embassy, and now we're hearing that Italy and Greece have also closed their embassies today. So Kiev might be on the verge of getting hit with a significant wave of Russian missiles. There are also rumors that they're going to use, what is it, the KS-26? Their, their intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missile that they're testing out at the moment. There is a rumor they're going to fling that at uh, Kiev. So this has caused embassies to get shut. So there's obviously serious enough uh, intel on a potential Russian strike. Um, so one to, to watch out for, powerful air attack on the Ukrainian capital could take place today. Now, Putin is apparently open to a deal to end the Ukraine war, but won't make any major territorial concessions, according to Reuters. The first thing to say here before we go into detail is that if Putin is ready for a deal, it means it's to his, in his best interests. It's to his advantage, it's to Russia's advantage. Putin insists Kiev abandons NATO membership. Russia may also be open to withdrawing from relatively small territory it controls in Kharkiv and Mykolaiv regions. Putin had said uh, any ceasefire deal must reflect reality on the ground before he fear but he fears a short-term truce that would only allow the West to rearm Ukraine. Domestically, Putin could sell the ceasefire under which Russia held most of Donetsk, Luhansk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson regions as a victory. The future of Crimea itself is not up for debate, all Russian officials have said. Peskov denied Reuters reports, stating that it is important for Moscow to achieve all the declared goals. So Peskov has come out and denied this. Um, but Russia potentially being up for a, a, a negotiation, I think, is ominous for Ukraine. I think the US are really going to be going hard on this now. I think they've given up on supporting Ukraine in the Trump administration. I think if you believe other, otherwise, you're going against all the data that's coming out and everything that everyone's saying. Um, on the other hand, 
y Europe have a choice to make. Here we have Emmanuel Macron saying we are helping Ukraine to resist because it's a victim of a war of aggression. We want peace, but peace that is not capitulation, which is what I see what Russia is looking out for there and what I think the US would enforce on Ukraine, which is a capitulation to Russia. Because then, he says, it is a peace based on the law of the strongest. I fully agree with several leaders, including President Zelensky, that peace will come in 2025. That is what we all want. It depends, first of all, on Russia, that it stops attacking, bombing, killing and invading. So it's starting to look a little ominous for, uh, for Ukraine, in my opinion. And it needn't have been so had we tooled up Ukraine as much as we possibly could. But everyone was afraid or... I think the Biden administration was afraid of um, escalation. And on the one, it's just this horrible situation where you had a, a, a Biden administration that was too weak and a Trump administration that's too pro-Russia. It's like, wow, what a horrible situation. So it's going to be up to Europe to help Ukraine if they are going to continue to resist Russia and not be forced into negotiations that benefit Russia. Now, Zelensky's then been on Fox News and said, if the US cuts aid, which they will do, I think we will lose. He said, Putin is weaker than the American leader. In any case, we will stay and fight. In case of reduction in aid from the US, we have our own production, but it's not enough to win. It's not enough even to survive. But he says, but we'll fight on, is, is I think the implication there. Um, if they will cut, I think we'll lose. Of course, anyway, we will stay and we will fight. We have production, but it's not enough to prevail. Uh, again, ominous language there from Zelensky. Um, now, Kiev Independent reports that as attitudes around potential future peace negotiations continue to shift in Ukraine, 52% of Ukrainians now say they would like to see their country negotiate to end to the war as soon as possible, according to a Gallup survey from yesterday. And that's a massive shift in opinion, and that could be because the writing's on the wall with regard to US support for Ukraine. If the US had been like, yep, we're going to support you big time and we're going to go all in and we're going to give you loads of stuff, then you would get a, a, a sense on the ground that actually we've got hope. I think the US um elections have probably dashed all hope because that's how i feel uh surveying all the details of this war every single day i feel deflated because of the election so goodness knows how ukrainians on the ground feel now poland considers increasing support for ukraine so this is the, the decision point for the rest of Europe. This is Radoslav Sikorsky, the foreign minister, saying we have been considering the possibilities of increasing our support for Ukraine. I note with appreciation the readiness of the largest EU countries to take over the burden of support for Ukraine in the context of a possible reduction in US involvement. So Europe's choices are, and this is just a, a random on, um, on Blue Sky, but I thought I'd have a look at this, uh, this thread. Uh, there are a thousand days of war that have taken place and for Europe it's time to make some harsh decisions. Uh, NATO is about to become stunted with the largest member either going into hibernation or pulling out outright. And even if that does not happen or the US returns later on, it will be a much weaker US. What I've seen nobody talk about is that the US military is about to suffer the largest wartime brain drain of a military force in history. Why? The answer is Trump's policies. It is hidden in that horrendous Project 2025 plan. Let me explain. He's intending to have all the generals swear an oath of loyalty to the president himself and have the army do things that the generals feel is unconstitutional. And about a third of them will obviously not do that and are now planning to either retire or outright leave the US. Anyway, with NATO most likely about to be gutted, it is indeed decision time in Europe. So what are the choices that we have? We have four main choices, it turns out. One, the first is to learn Russian, open our arms and welcome our comrade liberators. That is the wet dream of Orban and Fitzo and something that Schultz is willing to do. Hmm. Two, to let Ukraine fall, but this comes at a terrible price within two to five years. After that time, Russia will attack Europe. At that point, a reinforced Russia will attack both on the eastern and southern borders of Europe from our perspective. Finland down to Poland from uh, would be the eastern front and Moldova and Romania the southern front. It would cost us two to 20 million lives when that happens. 
Um, I don't know. I'm not 100% sure that Russia is remotely capable of doing that. Anyway, obviously, the Orbans and Fitzos and Schultzes of the world are fine with this happening. And they would just say that we should learn Russian and give up. 2 million dead is if we give up at this point. 20 million if we defend ourselves and inevitably win the war. A coalition three, the third option, a coalition of the willing go in and fight alongside Ukraine on the front line. This would be a death blow to the Russian invasion and for a very long time remove Russia as a threat. It would also dissuade China, Iran and Turkey from attacking Europe. How many dead? 100 to 250,000 soldiers, KIA, 250 to 600,000 wounded in action, a high price to pay, but it would safeguard our democracy, freedom, liberty and justice for decades, even if not even a century. Number four, a coalition of willing that goes in to take over the protection of the territory of Ukraine west of the Dnipro. This would include the borders towards Belarus and Transnistria and defending Odessa and northern Kherson. This alternative would come with few KIA and WIA and comes with the benefit for Ukraine that it would free up roughly 200,000 Ukrainian soldiers for the Eastern Front. Um, it would also give us a possibility to build up inside Ukraine in, a ca in case we need to cross the river in Dnipro and go into direct fighting in case we would have to. Uh, we would then have an existing supply chain inside Ukraine. So what is likely and what do I think? Alternative one is not an option. It, uh, if that was decided, the NB8 block in Europe would probably kickstart the war on their own, either directly going east or barrenting the war directly in Ukraine. Also, beyond Orban Fitzgerald Schultz, there's no political will for this. The second option is well understood in Europe. Giving up Ukraine would just lead to another much bigger war in Europe. There's also very little support for this beyond the troika of mental gerbils. Option three is a bit too gung-ho current currently and it will for now be seen as a last option that leaves us with the fourth option boots on the ground to secure western Korea, ukraine freeing up more ukrainian troops for the front line uh, with option three as a backup plan so what do i think after all i've spent the last thousand days thinking about it or more to the point i've spent the last 33 years in service thinking about it and i've always come to the same conclusion russia must be defeated full stop to quote joseph burrell russia must be balkanized into stamp sized micro nations european security demands this we must must give Russia a hard ultimatum. We must give them 24 hours to willingly leave Ukraine or we go in. We need to clearly state that we will, we will, as step one, take over security in Western Ukraine and that step two and six months later, we will be crossing the river Dnipro to help Ukraine evict Russia. Doing anything less will come with a terrible price for Europe to pay, millions of dead citizens, a wasteland along our borders that will take decades to rebuild if even possible. That's where NAFO and all the lovely fellows can make a difference. We must explain this horrendous price to everyone. So this then goes into talking about, you know, the... the um, the job of people like you and I on online explaining, you know, what's at stake, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I myself, I'm completely unsure that Europe has a backbone to enter into Ukraine. There's been talk about it. The Balkans, sorry, the Baltics have been somewhat up for it. Poland has been um, thinking about these kind of ideas, but I don't know that you'll get large European support appetite for that, especially with the growing distaste. Um, for, I, I guess, the war in certain elements of the electorate, such as Germany's AFD. We've just had Rassemblement National getting together with another far-right group in France and stopping uh, something in the French Assembly that would have given support for Ukraine. So you have problems in not only a, a Trump administration in the US, but problems within European politics as well. Now, moving on, we've got a couple of indicators of Russia's economy being in trouble. Gold on holidays. Olivia salad has increased its price by almost 70% in a year. So the so-called Olivia index has existed in the country since 2009. It helps measure consumer inflation using the well-known New Year's salad as an example. So you take one kind of food, you, you take a, a plate of food and you say, right, this is what we make every New Year. This is a traditional dish or whatever. How much did it cost this year? How much did it cost that? And that, now it's it's gone up 70% in a year. And that gives you a real indication of actual inflation on the ground there in Russia. Now, Chris P says, almost all in available resources in the Russian economy are already in use, said Elvira uh, Nabulina, head of the central bank. Next year, according to the central bank's forecast, the economy may find itself on the verge of stagnation, according to the Moscow Times. So she's announced that almost all resources of the Russian economy have been exhausted. Russia's economy is in a wee bit of trouble. Now, I'm going to leave you with this. I think I've won the internet. Uh, I've, I've won life, not the internet, because lots of people have this. But I, I think you succeed in life when you get people just randomly shitposting you on on um twitter 
So this is some American Jordan Akam Motrax um, saying this. I just thought I'd play this to you just to give him the joy of being on my video. Um, uh, yeah. This message goes out to Jonathan M.F. Perth, Ukraine law, ATP geopolitics. Yeah, you're full of shit that we weren't going to win this, dude. You and your snarky goddamn liberals need to stay the fuck out of our politics. You're not even an American citizen. Telling me, well, you don't have any facts, you're just a troll from the blah, 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 blah. Yeah, guess what? Fuck you, motherfucker. We won. America won. You goddamn bitches lost. Now I gotta get back to work. It's always nice to have, um, really pleasant conversations talk talk to people across the aisle and uh discuss things even when we disagree with each other so that's nice that's very nice of him thank you for that really really appreciate that there's a oh there's a word we used to use oh i can't is it french no it's english what is it dick that's it yeah anyway Take care, toodle pips.